Okay, good morning, South Point Church. How are we doing today? Yeah, that sounds fairly nice. I know it's a cold morning this morning. People keep asking me, Chris, why do you wear t-shirts on during the winter? And I'll, I'll tell you exactly why. Well, because I had to go buy new clothes and t-shirts is what was on sale. So <laughs> that's why you see me up here in the winter time wearing a short sleeve t-shirt. So, um, but listen, I'm really excited about today. I'm excited about Sundays. Sundays are my my favorite day. It really is my favorite time to be with you guys. And uh, part of that is because I just love that you're here. And when I think about you being here, I think, okay, if you think about the magic of your presence here, and your presence here really is magical to me because you could be anywhere in the world right now. You could be on vacation. You could be at home in bed. You could be at a friend's house. You could be anywhere in the world, but you're here. You could have gotten up this morning and your car could have not started and therefore you would not have made it. Um, someone in your house could have been sick and you would have had to have stayed home with a kid or with a sick person, but that didn't happen because you're here. And so I just want us to be intentional today and I wanna recognize the fact that you're here and it's not by accident, it's not by circumstance, and it's not even by, by habit. You're here because there's a reason for you to be here today. You're here because there's a purpose for you today. So I want to start out, and I want us to, to go ahead and get our hearts set in the right place and get our minds set in the right place that I am here in this seat. I'm here in this building today for a reason and for a purpose. There's a specific reason for you to be here today. And that specific reason is something that, that God wants you to get. And so whether you believe in God or whether you don't believe in God, whether you've been coming for 100 years or today is your first Sunday, I want you to know that there is something here for you today, and it's something good. So let's all raise our expectations of what we expect God to do in our lives today through today's message. And, and I feel confident in that. I feel confident that if we raise our expectations and we say, God, I expect you to do something in my life because I need it and because I'm here, then he'll do it. And I feel so strongly about this today because we're talking about something that, that I identify with so much. And it's this big question around who am I? Now, these are questions. Uh, it's, it's a question that's part of a series of questions that are like these core things that we think about as people. But, but who are you? Who are you really? Has anybody this week or even this morning or over the last month questioned this? Like, who am I? Maybe you did something that you're not proud of. And you think, man, who am I to do this? Have you lost your identity? I know a lot of parents in, in the whole kind of circus of raising kids, you, you kind of lose some of who you are because everything becomes about raising kids. And, and if that's you, you know, thank you for pouring into your kids. And also, it's okay for you to ask the question of, man, who am I? I, I don't really understand who I am anymore. This is something that, that is tied so closely to identity. And the fact that it's tied so closely to identity is what makes it so important to us. Because our identity is associated with who we are and who we think we are. So it, it's like, what, what is your identity? So I like to think it's, it's what you think about yourself is actually what determines your identity. So the thing that you think about who you are, that's what's determining your identity. And that's what's helping you answer the question of who am I? So I'll, I'll give you some examples of this, okay? I like to think of myself as a healthy person. I like to think of myself as someone that prioritizes health, that prioritizes exercise. And so part of the way that I think about myself as a, as a healthy person, it starts to determine my identity. And my identity starts to become something like I go to the gym and I lift weights. So I spend time in the gym five days a week. I'm lifting weights. And that, that identity, I think of myself as a weightlifter. I think of myself as a healthy person. And that begins to influence who I am. And I become known as somebody that goes and lifts weights. In fact, last week I wasn't able to go to the gym at all because we had uh, a team of, of people from the States here. And when I went back, a whole bunch of people, the, the, the 2 p.m. crowd said, hey, man, where were you? Because it's not like you to not be here. And because that was part of my identity. Now, on the other hand, there's another part of my identity that kind of is in conflict to this. See, what I think about myself determines my identity. I, I think every single day about how much I love ice cream. And based on how much I love ice cream, that is beginning to influence my identity. 
I think about how much I, okay, let me ask you guys this. Who here in this room has memorized what ice cream is available at which petrol stations? Thank you, thank you. I do have some honesty in the front. So when I go to the gym, I have this identity that, that I am a healthy person and therefore I am going to be healthy and therefore I'm going to go lift weights. But when I leave the gym, my other identity of how much I love ice cream, it comes up. And no matter how much I, I, I love being a healthy person, as I pass a, a geographical marker in Google Maps, something in me starts to say, ice cream, ice cream ice cream and then I pull over and I know that the Caltex in Pineland sells a one liter container of Marcel strawberry low-fat frozen yogurt and that identity begins to dictate who am I I'm a person that likes healthy things and I'm also a person that likes ice cream now I say this to illustrate this point that the more attractive an idea is the more power it has over the influence of your behavior the more attractive an idea is, the more power it has to influence your behavior. Now, I know I've given you a silly example. I wish it wasn't true, but it is true. But, but it plays out in, in my life in this silly example of, hey, you know what? Ice cream is really attractive. And, and that, a lot of times, is more attractive than being hungry and being sore. And so that influences my behavior because it's the more attractive idea. It's the more attractive part of my identity. Now, we, we started to look at this last week, and I want to return back to what we looked at last week because it has so much to do with, with our identity. It's so much to do with who we are. See, listen, my heart is burdened for you because this question of who am I, it never stops being pursued, and it never stops needing an answer. You always need to know who you are. And everything in the world wants to take you one way or another. So many different attractive things come into your life. And so many different attractive ideas want to pull you from one side or pull you to the next side. And then we have this identity that goes like the waves of the ocean. It comes and it goes and it ebbs and it flows. And we're missing some consistency there. And, and that's not a great way to live. And so I want to look at that in the story of Adam and Eve. And, and we talked about this last week. We're going to look at it from a different lens today. And this is a perfect example of a couple that were given an identity. And that they, they were given a purpose. And they were told who they were by God himself. But then something more attractive to them came along. And it pulled their identity in the wrong direction. So if we look at Genesis 3.1... This is, this is Adam and Eve. So in, in this verse here, you've got the serpent, which turns out to be Satan, is speaking to Eve. Now, the serpent was more crafty, so he was subtle, he was skilled, he was, in, he was very a deceitful animal, than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Because God had given Adam and Eve three commandments. The commandment number one was to go and fill the world. So God said, I want you guys to make a whole bunch of babies. He made them both naked, told them there was nothing wrong with being naked. And then he said, go and reproduce. And that sounds like a really good gig to me. Then the second thing God told them was, to, was everything in the world, everything that was created was to submit to them. They were to subdue all the living creatures on the world, meaning they had no predators, they had nothing to be afraid of, which I started thinking today, well, that explains the naked thing because then mosquitoes had to submit to Adam and Eve, and so therefore they couldn't have mosquito bites. But the third thing that they were told to do was just to not eat from the tree, the tree in the middle of the garden. Just don't eat from that. So they had three simple rules. And so Satan is saying to Eve, can, can it really be that God said, you, know, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And then in, in Genesis verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, otherwise you will die. So, so far we're on the right track. Eve is tracking with her identity. She's added a little bit to God's command. God said, don't eat it. And she's added, don't touch it. But she's kind of tracking with her identity, with, with her purpose, with who God made her to be. And then we see in the next verse, but the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. I think this is maybe that moment where Eve says, okay, 
that's kind of attractive. I'm not going to have the consequence that God said that I would have. And then in verse 5, For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. That is, you will have greater awareness and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. So you know what was becoming more and more attractive to Eve? See, Eve was created in God's image. Eve was created to want to be like God. But what became attractive is that Eve started to consider the idea that she could be God. She could be equal to and share the same attributes as God. So now Eve's identity is starting to be pulled because there's something very attractive that's pulling her that way. And so then in verse 6, Eve, she makes a decision. And when the woman saw that this tree was good for food and that it was delightful to look at and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful like God was because she knows now she won't die, she took some of the fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband with her and then he ate it. So there's a biblical example. I gave you my silly example, but here's a biblical example. And, and I think this is important for you because if Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, if they were set in the garden, if they were given uh, three simple rules, if there was a, a, an evening walk with God that they did in the cool summer breeze every single day, with all of those things stacked in their favor, with all of those things kind of at, 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 as, as a, as, I don't know how God can make it any easier. I really don't. I don't know how God can make their identity any more clear than that. And yet, they still swayed from their identity. And they, they followed something that they thought was more attractive. So if, if this is nearly impossible for Adam and Eve, who were given everything in the world, then how are we to think that our identity can't be swayed? I mean, do you guys realize how many things come at you every day, all day long? Everything you scroll through in social media is made to influence you in a certain way. Hey, guess what? We even do this to you at church. We use subliminal messaging all the time here. We do. I'm using this whole thing to the advantage of the church and to God. That's why there's things like branding. That's why we use the same colors everywhere. That's why there's signs in the parking lot so that you know where to go. That's why when you come in, and you get that little mint and it's got a little piece of paper on it and it says a church to call home, a family to call your own, is I'm trying to embed good stuff into your brain. Because all week long, and even while you're sitting here, there's other things that are trying to embed into your brain, more attractive things that are trying to pull you in different ways. There's social media, there's the news, there's the influence of your friends, the influence of the world, all the bright, shiny things, all the wonderful things, credit cards, all that stuff's trying to pull you in different directions. And what it's doing is it's diluting your identity and it's taking your identity and it's swaying you from what you were created to be. And it's making you choose something you think that's more attractive. Now, th there's a couple of things that Eve could have done that we can do every day in every decision that we make that can equip us to try and keep from swaying so far away from our identity. And the first of those things is that we can pay closer attention. So in Eve's context... When the serpent comes up to her and starts talking to her, you know, Eve maybe could have paid attention to what the serpent was saying or what the serpent was doing, and she could have said, hey, wait a minute, you're twisting what God said. I, I, I'm, I'm paying attention to you. See, God said we can't eat the fruit, but you said we can't even touch the fruit. Wait, no, hold on, now I'm confused, serpent. You've confused me because now I'm adding things to it. No, 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 this isn't right. So Eve didn't pay attention to what was going on. And we don't pay attention. We're, we're like the, the frog in a pot of cold water where, where the stove's turned on and it's slowly, so, slowly boiling. And before we know it, we're in boiling water. Well, what would happen if you paid attention that the, the moment that the water started to get warm? You would say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. I need to change my situation. The second thing is that she could have thought critically. And we can think critically about the things that, that are coming into our lives. Hey, is this true? Is this right? Just because you read one post on Facebook, it does not make it right or real. Instead, I, I want you to think critically. I want you to say, what's another source to this? What's, a, what's, another, um, what's another thing that supports this information? If Eve had, had taken 
what the serpent had said to her and filtered some critical thinking through this, then maybe she could have understood that the serpent was trying to trick her and take her down a wrong path. And then the, the last one that we can do is we can be intentional. And Eve could have been intentional. Intentional to say, this is who I'm not going to be, and this is who I am going to be. This is who I was created to be, and I'm not going to waver from that and become this instead. See, I want to challenge you guys this week. If you can take a picture of this, or you can write it down, or you can remember it, pay attention, think critically, be intentional. Now, this is not, this is not the magic formula for knowing your identity. This is just something practical that you can do. Hey, and it may not... Even if it doesn't fix your identity, it may save you from sending an email or making a post on social media or putting a video out there somewhere or a comment on something that later down the road is going to cause you a whole lot of hurt and heartache. And this may save you from that. See, when we don't do things like this, we find ourselves in the same pattern that Eve found herself in. And that pattern is, it, it starts with this deceptive idea. And then it goes to a distorted desire and it ends in a destructive behavior. See, the deceptive idea for Eve was, hey Eve, you can be God. You can be equal to God. That pulls her from her identity. The distorted desire is, Eve, you don't need to be like God. You need to be God. And then the destructive behavior is that her and Adam sat there and they ate the fruit. Now, this is what happens with Adam and Eve after they, they eat the fruit. We pick back up in Genesis. Then the eyes of the two of them were opened. That is, their awareness increased. And they knew that they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then in verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool afternoon breeze of the day. So the man and his wife hid. They kept themselves hidden from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So now we ask the question of who am I? And the answer to that question is, I am guilt, I am shame. Adam and Eve, after they did this destructive behavior, after they swayed and followed what was attractive, and they followed their hearts towards a different identity, when they went to answer the question, who am I? All of a sudden, you had, the, you had guilt and you had shame into the world for the very first time. And how do we know that? Well, because they hid themselves. They hid themselves from each other and they hid themselves from God. Hello, guilt. Hello, shame. If any of us deal with guilt and shame, this is where it all starts. It all started from having kind of a messed up identity. Now, what I want to do with you today is I want, to, I want to help you guys get freedom from guilt and shame. I deal with guilt and shame all the time. It's a struggle for me, for sure. And you know what? It's a struggle for a lot of people because we see it at the beginning of creation. We see it when God created the first two people. They chose something that led them to guilt and shame. And there is a way that we can deal with this. There's a way that we can change the way that we think. There's a way that we can change our identity. Because remember, what you think about yourself becomes your identity. And your identity reflects how you answer the question of who am I? And so let's look to Paul in Romans 12. And what Paul's doing is he's writing to a, a group of Christians in Rome. And these were new Christians. And he wants to make sure that they understand this new concept. Because up until Jesus died on the cross... There was guilt, there was shame, there was a price that had to be paid for the sins that you committed. There was, yeah, you should feel guilty and should feel bad about what you did wrong. And you know what? You better go to the temple and get cleansed for it. You better go make a, a sacrifice for it or else you're going to have to live with this for the whole rest of your life. And then when Jesus comes, Jesus pays the price for all of us. And then if you choose Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then all of a sudden you don't have to carry any guilt and you don't have to carry any shame. But this was such a, a, a new concept. It's a concept that we've had forever, and we still can't accept it. And so as a brand new concept, Paul is saying, I want to make sure that you understand this. I want to make sure that you get this, because this is going to change your life. This is going to change how you answer the question of who am I? What is my identity? And so he, he's writing, and he says this. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, 
Logical, intelligent, active worship. Now, if that seems like a mouthful for you, I, I've made this a little bit simpler for you. And it says this, because of God's mercy, because of God's mercy for you, He is asking you to make sacrifices to the way that you live and the way that you think about yourself. See, th here we go. The way that you think about yourself. Paul is saying, I want you to change the way that you think about yourself. I want you to make sacrifices to that. Meaning, I want you to sacrifice the thoughts of guilt and shame. And instead, I want you to change the way that you think. The way you think here. Because it has so much to do with influencing everything in you. And so then Paul goes on in the next verse. And he adds to this. And he says, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Uh, you could insert social media there. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, right there for superficial values and customs. And he says, but instead be transformed and progressively change. That means you keep changing and moving forward in your life as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, which he explains is focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. See, Paul starts hitting on this thing of renewing your mind, renewing your mind, renew your mind. So what is that? Well, we, we've got terms for that now. This, those terms are, are neuroplasticity and, and neurogenesis. Now, these are two big science terms. A lot of us know about these. Um, but essentially what these mean is this is science catching up with what the Bible says. All right, And I'll explain this to you. But this is science supporting what Paul says in Romans. So Paul said this thing in Romans, and then later science supported it. It's not that science created it and that we linked it back to what Paul said. No, it's the other way around. Paul said it, and science catches up to it. And so neuroplasticity is this idea that you can actually change the physical matter in your mind. The way that you think, it changes the way that your mind is shaped. The way that, the way that you think about yourself, the way that you handle the world around you, it actually changes your mind. So if you're somebody... That, that has a negative mindset, you can actually change that. Now, not only does it change the way you think about yourself, it literally, physically changes the makeup in your mind. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about depression. So that, there's a thing called major depressive disorder. And when you have a major depressive breakdown, which I know some of us in here have dealt with. I'm like the king of these things. But when you have a depressive breakdown, it actually forms grooves in your brain. And these act almost like, like a canyon. Or maybe if you think about the side of a road, where, where the side of the road goes down, the bank goes down. And then if you have another depressive breakdown, then that canyon or that, that bank, it gets wider and wider and wider. So the more depressed you get, the wider that thing gets. And then the more breakdowns you have, the more inclined you are to have another depressive breakdown. So if you wonder, why do I keep going through so much anxiety or why do I keep going through so much depression? Well, because your brain is physically making it easier for you to slip into these depressions. And so what therapists do, what psychologists do, is they try and stop that destructive behavior physically in your brain by teaching you things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is where you take a negative thought, you turn it into a positive thought. And when you do that, you're physically rebuilding your brain. How amazing is that, that God made us with the ability to do that? You can physically change the way that your brain looks on an MRI, on a scan. That's because God made our brains, He made our minds renewable. Now this second word, neurogenesis, this is even more amazing. Did you know that every day you wake up and you're born with brand new brain cells? This gives hope to all the 14-year-old kids in the room or all the parents of a 14-year-old kid or a 13-year-old kid. Is that, man, they're gonna, they are going to get more brain cells. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep happening. It's going to keep coming. But what this means for you is that every single day you wake up with new opportunity. You wake up with new opportunity to take these new brain cells and actually change those and shape those for the good in your mind, for the good in your thinking. And guess what happens? The better you think about yourself, the better your identity is, and the better that you can answer the question of who am I? So wherever you are now, I just want you to know that you can begin to change that. And every single day you get new opportunity to do that. Now, there's an, another rule or another law that I want to talk about. There's a doctor... 
And this guy created this law and it's called, or he created this rule and it's called Hebb's rule. And this came out of a lot of research. And it says, cells that fire together, wire together. And what that means is repetitive thought leads to reflexive, repetitive behavior. So repetitive thought leads to reflexive, repetitive behavior. So I'll give you an example for that. When I come into Pinelands in the morning, I come down uh, the, the, the main drag there, and if I turn left, I come to the church. Well, every morning, I bring my son Benjamin to school. And when we come to the robot at Howard Center, every single morning, almost every single morning, I take a left there when I'm supposed to take a right there. And then Benjamin says, Daddy, we're going the wrong way. Now, the reason I do that is because I have so repetitively come to this building that my mind just slips into this repetitive behavior of come to robot, turn left. And I have to remind myself, no, I have, I have another person in the car, come to robot, turn right to take him to school. See, our repetitive thoughts, they, re, they lead to reflexive, repetitive behavior. Now, what this means for you is that the thing that is the most repetitive thought in you is the thing that is creating the most reflexive behavior in you. So what's your most repetitive thought? I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna go hard and strong on this one. I'm worthless. That's my most repetitive thought. Well, you know what? If that's your most repetitive thought, then your most reflexive behavior is gonna reflect that. You're gonna behave like a worthless person. If your most repetitive thought is, is I'm not a good dad or I'm not a good mom, then guess what? Your behavior is gonna start to reflect that. If your most repetitive thought is, is, is that I'm the victim and everybody else out there is out to get me, then guess what? Your behavior is going to put you on the defense. And you're going to live your life defensively every single day. See, the, the thing that rules your mind is actually going to be the ruler of your life. The ruler of your mind is the ruler of your life. What is it that rules your mind? What is your most repetitive thought? What, th this is, guys, this is your moment here. Don't miss this part. See, at the end of this message, I'm hoping that you'll be able to answer the question of I know who I am, or at least I know how to find out who I am. But if you don't, if you don't get this now, then in seven minutes, you're not going to get the end. You've got to identify and own up to. Search your heart. Search your soul for what is actually ruling my mind. What is actually ruling my life? Is it fear? Is it guilt? Is it shame? Is it inadequacy? Is it, um, what, I don't know what it could be in your life. It's easy for me to come up with my own, but I don't know what yours is. But I know that you have one. See, remember that thing that I started the message with? That you're here for a purpose and you're here for a reason? You could be anywhere else in the world but you're not. You're here. You're in this room. You're listening to me. And the reason that you're listening to this is because God wants you to identify and you're thinking, what is my most repetitive thought? What is the thing that is ruling my mind? What is the thing, therefore, that is ruling my life? And I want you to start to identify what this is. Now, the, the next thing that I would ask you is, does your current reality match God's proposed truth for you? So if you may be having a hard time answering the question of what is my most repetitive thought or what is the thing that is taking more control over my life? What, you know, if you say, ah, you know, I'm not really sure. I don't think that I have something. I mean, come on, like I'm fine. Everything's okay. I don't have this big glaring issue that's happening in my life right now. Like I'm okay in social circles. I'm okay with my family. Like, you know, everything is kind of okay. Well, let, let me ask you this. Does your current reality so the reality that you live in now, who you are now, what Monday looks like to you, what Tuesday looks like to you, what it feels like when you go to bed at night, what thoughts you're left alone with when you're sitting in traffic in the car, when that reality, that reality of you, how you actually live, who you actually are, your cravings for food, your cravings for other substances, your cravings for care and for comfort, your craving for relationship, your reality, does your reality match God's proposed truth for you. Now, this is a hard question to answer if you don't understand God's truth for you. See, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
so that whoever believes in him can have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. See, when God created you, he created a purpose for you. You were made in the image of God, just like Adam and Eve were. You were made in his image. Somebody right now in this room needs to say that back to themselves silently in your mind. You need to say to yourself, I'm made in the image of God. You need to say that I'm created with purpose. You need to say to yourself, I'm created with meaning. You need to say, I'm no accident. God has a plan for me. He has a plan for my life. And it doesn't have anything to do with what the world is throwing at me. Instead, God has a proposed plan. He has a purpose truth for who I am. And I may be so far away from that, but you know what? I'm going to start taking steps towards it and start getting closer and closer to it. And I'm going to think about it every single day. It's going to change the way my mind works, which is going to change my identity. And then I'm going to be able to answer the question of who am I? I am somebody that God has a purposed, proposed truth for. But we have to start changing the way that we think. See, the thing that you think about yourself is what is fundamentally forming who you are being formed into. What you think about yourself is fundamentally who you are being formed into. See, the, the, there's no, no one gets a pass here. No one gets a pass. No one, no one gets to say, well, this doesn't apply to me. This is science-based. And before it was science-based, it was Bible-based. This is why Paul said, hey, I want you to renew your minds every single day. This is why Eve and Adam, why they, they fell the way that they did. Because they weren't being careful. They weren't being intentional. They weren't being critical. They were just letting whatever came into them. The thing that they were supposed to have authority over, the serpent, took authority over their minds and their thoughts. And when they gave up the authority over their thoughts, then it changed what was attractive to them. So, what authority over your thinking have you given up? What have you let have authority over your thoughts as opposed to you having authority over it? Man, I can think of a million examples for that. But I'll ask you, what, what is destructively occupying your mind? What is it? What is that thing in you that's there that's tearing you down? Because that thing that's in you, that's destructive, that guilt, that shame, that depression, that anxiety, where does that depression come from? Where does that anxiety come from? Where does the lack of self-worth come from? Where does um, the, the inability to form relationships come from? Where does the inability to forgive come from? Where does the inability to accept forgiveness from somebody else come from? Where does all of that come from? It comes from somewhere. And it may come from an event in your life or it may come from something that your parents passed down to you or it may come because you suffered uh, the, the consequences of sin and the consequences of humanity just hit you in the wrong way and no, you didn't deserve it and it wasn't supposed to happen to you, but it did. But there's something that's destructively occupying your mind because you think about it over and over and over and over again. And so guys, today, let's, let's, let's get set free from this. Can today be the day that you take the first step towards changing your identity and therefore towards answering the question of who am I? And be able to answer that question with, I am somebody that God has proposed this wonderful truth for my life. And so this takes us back to the title of this series, which is, Did God Really Say? Did God really say that you are guilty? Did God really say that you are worthless? Did God really say that you are depressed? Did God really say that you have no meaning to your life? Did God really say that you're a failure? Did God really say that you're a bad friend? Did God really say that you shouldn't speak up because no one cares about what you have to say? Did God really say that you should make yourself small because you're not worth somebody paying attention to? Did God really say that, that because you don't earn enough money, you're not worth something to your family that you think that you should be worth? Did, did God really say that you're broken? The answer to that is no. 
But I can tell you some things that God did say. Did God really say that you are forgiven? Hey, yes, he did. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. Did God really say that you are loved? Hey, yes, he did. All through the Bible. From the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, the rest of the Bible is all about God restoring a relationship of love with you. This is why God sent Jesus to come and die on the cross for you. Because God did say that you are loved. Did God really say that you are free? Yes, he did. Your sin, your past, your destructive, whatever it is that you did in the past, it's gone. It's done. That sin that you committed this morning, guess what? It's gone. It's done. Repent. Move on with your life. Because what God did say is that you're free. He didn't say that you're chained or that you're in bondage. No, God said you're free. Yes, he did. And then for me, the one that means the most, the one that's, that's the most important to me, that God said is, did God really say that you are mine? Yes, he did. No matter what I think about myself, no matter what you think about yourself, no matter what your day looks like, no matter what you're going through, whether you're broken down on the side of the road with a blown radiator, or whether you've had a death in your family, or whether you're running on all four spare tires, or whatever it is in your life, whatever that hard moment is in you, you can come back to this and you can say, you know what, I may not believe anything else because I'm too weak to believe it. But what I can believe is that God did say that I'm his and that's truth. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna give you guys a moment to accept this in, in your life. And the band is gonna come out, they're gonna lead us in a last song. And what I want you to do is I want you to, I want you to take your heart to God and say, God, here's all the things that I would put in that box. Here, here's the repetitive behaviors, the repetitive thoughts that I would put in the box. But God, did you really say that about me? And I just want you to let the answer no wash over you. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that either. And I want you to pick a truth that God did say about you. And if you can't pick a truth, then pick my favorite. God did say, that you are mine. So let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray.